Hey everybody, um, welcome to chapter 12. So we did chapters 11 and 13, which dealt with lines and space and writing equations of lines. And then 13 started to deal more with planes and how you know three-dimensional objects travel and move. And we're actually gonna do the same thing with 12 and 14, but we're gonna use a different way of moving in space called vectors. And some of you have had physics before, um, will have seen a lot of work with vectors. And so you're probably gonna see things that you can quickly relate um, between the two. So that might be really helpful and handy for you. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about what a vector actually is in this unit. Uh, and we're gonna talk about how to add vectors, subtract vectors, do all sorts of different vector operations. And then eventually we're gonna get to a point where we're writing a vector equation of a line. Okay. So in general, um, what are we dealing with when we're dealing with vectors? Um, if you have two points in space, right, we call the, if we go from P1 to P2, um, an arrow. So I'm going to draw a little picture here. So if I've got a little picture and I had two points in space, I'm going to draw an arrow between the two points that connects them. And that arrow the, the, the fact that that one has an arrow head shows you the direction that you are moving. So that's important. So it's kind of like when we were studying lines and parametrics and we were moving in a particular direction. This is showing the direction of movement. Okay. So um, we call this vector. We can call this vector by a lowercase letter name. So like I could put a little lowercase letter here. I use the vector symbol. It's, it's a harpoon actually. So I could say vector A. And I can also discuss this vector in terms of how much I'm moving in each direction. So let's talk about figuring that out. So for example, if I wanted to know how much I change oops, horizontally, oops, let's do that in a different color. So if I think about how much I change to go from the beginning to the second point, so this is this is your starting or initial point, and this is your terminal point, right? Because we're going from P1 to P2. That's really important. It's different if I went the other direction. So I want to know basically how much am I going in the X direction and how much am I going in the Y direction to get to that point, which basically creates this little right triangle, you know? And so then I can also, not only can I give it a name, but I can express the movement that I take to get there. So I could say vector A, for example, would be like if this direction, let's say that this was five and that this was three, then I could say vector A goes five comma three, meaning the change in X is five and the change in Y is three. So this is called component form. And it gives you how you move. That's really important. It's giving you how you move. OK, so that's so that's generally kind of a vector. Now let's go back and pick up some of these other little parts. OK, so again, these are directed line segments. These arrows that we're going to be creating in two space are directed line segments. Um, we have something called their magnitude. So the vectors have a magnitude or a length, and they have a direction, which is, you know, where they're headed. And this is very closely related to directional cosines. So a vector, again, if I were to draw a vector, it has a magnitude or a length, which you're familiar with magnitude. Um, and then it also has a direction that it's headed. And we're going to use an angle to talk about that. All right. Um, if we want to say that these two arrows or vectors are equivalent, then they have to have, as you might imagine, the same magnitude and be going in the same direction. So, for example, I could have a bunch of vectors. If they're all headed in the same direction and have the same magnitude, we call these equivalent vectors. Okay. So. How do we test for equivalence? Like if we wanted to know if two vectors are equivalent, how would we do that? Well, basically, guys, I'm not going to go through this huge big proof. You could look through it if you wanted to. You could pause it and look through it. Um, but I want to see if they have the same direction and the same magnitude. So the way that I could do that in a quick version would be to see if the change in x between the two points and the change in y between the two points are exactly the same. So that would have to be the first part. 
and their magnitude would have to be the same. And the magnitude, the length of the vector, is basically that right triangle it's hypotenuse. So you would be looking to see if the change in x squared plus the change in y squared square rooted is the same for both. Okay. Again, if you want to look through the proof, you can, but this is basically what you're looking at. If this is the same, they're going to have the same direction and the same magnitude. Okay. So let's look at an example of finding um, some equivalent vectors. Let's just do a few now while we're here. All right, I'm going to give you three points, and I want you to see if you can figure out the coordinate of point D so that these two, and it would be, um, I think the typeface just didn't show up. Those should be, um, that they're not parentheses. They do look like this. This is a vector, not a, not a point. Okay, so we're trying to say that the vector from A to B, point A to B, is the same as the vector from point C to D. And you're going to find the point D that would make that true. If you want to hit pause, this would be a great time to try this on your own and see if you can find that point. Okay, so hopefully you've taken a second to try it. I'm, I'll plot these just so that we can see what we're dealing with. So there's A, 5, negative 1, negative 2, 5 is B. C is 3, 7. And so I'm looking for D. So you can think of it like this. Again, I want to go from A, the vector from A to B, and I want that to be equivalent from C to D. So D has to be somewhere out here is another way you can think of it. What I would do is this. I would start by finding what my vector AB is made up of. So what is the change in X? Well, to go from 5 to negative 2, you would have went negative 7. To go from negative 1 to 5, you would have went positive 6. So there are the components of the change in X and change in Y. Okay, what would it be for C to D? Well, I don't know D, so I'm going to have to say it would be whatever D's X coordinate is, minus 3, and whatever D's Y coordinate is, minus 7, right? Because that's what I'm going to, I'm going to be looking for the change. So then I can use this information to solve, because like I know that this needs to be negative 7, and I know right now that it would be whatever the x value is, minus 3. Add 3, x would be negative 4. I can do the same thing with the y. I need it to have a total change of positive 6. Some of you can do this just by looking at it. Like some of you could go, oh, if this needs to be a positive change of 6, then that would have to be 13. And if this has to be a, you know, have a change of negative 7, if I go down by 7, that would make the x value negative 4. I mean, again, not that hard because the numbers are pretty nice. But if you had some nasty numbers, you could do it this way. So the point D, notice it is a point, so I'm going back to the coordinates, would be negative 4, comma 13. You could also try the second example. So if you wanted to pause that, you could do that. What are the coordinates of a point P such that A, B, and O, P are equal? Again, we're talking vectors here, and O is the origin. So A, B hasn't changed. A, B still needs to be a change of negative 7 for the X and positive 6 for the Y. So the origin, you know, would be 0, 0. So I'd be going from 0, 0 to some point P. Same idea, x minus 0, y minus 0. So that would just make it negative 7. Oops, it's a point. So P would just be negative 7, 6, which could, should make sense because you're basically going from the origin. So it should be whatever you want the change to be, which was the same as up here. Okay. So again, these really are just vectors. This is just me talking about that a little bit uh, more. Again, your vector connects your two points. So you have this little harpoon, P1, B2, P2. This means it starts at 1, goes to P2. We can use also a lowercase letter. Um, a lot of times they'll make this bold so that you know that it's a vector. Um, but again, remember that when we say vectors are equivalent, they're all, any vector that's the same length in the same direction. Okay, so any one of these vectors could represent a bunch of them. Like, again, if I had a bunch of vectors that were the same length and in the same direction, right, assuming these were all the same, then any version, any of this component form version of the change in x and change in y would be the same for all these same vectors. Okay. Um, so if we had to think of a best possible starting location, if it doesn't really matter where the vectors are, 
as far as how we get this change in x and change in y, where might be the nicest place in a coordinate plane to start a vector if you could choose anywhere? Yeah, the origin. So if a vector starts at the origin, that's the easiest to talk about its change in x and change in y because, for example, its change in x and y will be the coordinates. So for example, this little point out here, if this was, if this was b, if I wanted a, b, well, point b is at, it looks like, 5, 2. And because you started at the origin, that would mean the vector is also a change in 5, change in 2. So that would be the nicest place to do it. It's the easiest way. These are called position vectors because we're starting them at the origin. So again, you can move any vector you want to any spot you want. So we always talk about vectors as far as position vectors just because it's easiest. It's kind of like using a unit circle um, with trig because it's the easiest one. Okay, so we're going to do some operations with our vectors. Um, we're going to make the vectors longer or shorter um, without changing their direction, you know, so something like this. We might go from that to that. So we want to know how to change their magnitude. Um, that's something called scalar multiplication, which we'll do in a moment. We're going to add vectors together. Two or more. We'll start with two and we'll do some more. Um, and then we'll talk about what their sum looks like or the, what the resultant vector looks like. And we're going to learn a bunch of different ways to do these. So you'll be learning um, what's, what's best in what situation. Okay. Um, we will do these on a coordinate grid, so on a graph, um, but we'll also do them algebraically um, where it's, um, you know, we don't have to use that geometric structure to make it work. Okay. Um, so first off, let's do uh, scalar multiplication. So how do I make a vector longer? All right. So again, um, just as a vector is a directed line segment that has magnitude and position, a scalar is a plane number that has magnitude but no direction. So it, and it will make it longer or shorter. Okay, so let's think about what we need, first of all, to talk about a vector's magnitude. So I'm going to, I think I have a blank page after here. Maybe not. Let me get one in here. Okay. So let's think about this. I think it'll be a little easier if we kind of just do it together. So again, let's start with our vector. We'll make our vector go from maybe 1, 2. Actually, well, let's go in the other direction. Let's go 1, 5. And then we'll go down 4 over 3. Call this B. So I'm headed in that direction. So I'm going from A, which is 1, 5, to B, which is 4, 1. There we go. Okay. So we are going to want to change this vector's magnitude. So the first thing we have to do is find it. So let's start by finding vector AB. Again, note that this harpoon is on top. The capital letters are normal size, and then this is on top. What you don't want to do is draw your harpoon so big and your letters so small. You really want to have the letters, and this is just on top. Okay, change in X to go from, remember, we're going in this direction from A to B. So from A to B is plus 3. For the X, sorry, for the X direction, and down 4 for the Y. Yeah, which makes sense. If I go over here to my picture, this is down 4 over positive 3. I'm going to get rid of that, but you can see what that kind of looked like. Okay. Okay, this is my component form, and it lets me know how I move. It's only telling me how I move, guys. It didn't tell me where I started. It just told, told me how I changed. Okay, so the first thing we should probably do if we want to be able to change the magnitude is figure out the magnitude. The way that we write magnitude for a vector is we put what looks like absolute values around the vector or absolute an absolute value around the, ve the vector. Sometimes you'll see a book do it with a double, a double absolute value sign, but single is fine. So this means the length of the vector. So, okay, let's find the length of the vector. That would be the two sides of your right triangle. So again, change in x squared plus change in y squared square rooted. Again, you're just finding the hypotenuse, basically. Distance formula like we did before. Okay. This one I made come out nice, so the magnitude here is 5. The length of this vector is 5. 
Okay, so let's say that we wanted to make the magnitude, I'll do and start with an easy one. Let's say we wanted to make the magnitude 10. What would we have to do if we wanted to make the magnitude 10? Just to the component form. I, you could, yes, you could give me the point, but for now I just wanna know what happens to the change in. Well, if I double this from five to 10, then I have what type of scenario here? Yeah, similar triangles. So if I double this, then that means each of these directions gets doubled. So I would become six in the x direction, positive, and negative eight. So I basically took my vector times two. Why? Because this is my magnitude times two. Okay, what do you think would happen then if I wanted it to have a magnitude of 25? Well, it would be the original magnitude times how much? Five. So you would take each of the components times five. So that would be 15 in the x direction, negative 20 in the y direction. So this is all nice and easy when I'm giving you nice numbers. In fact, I'm going to give you one more nice number. You may not think it's so nice at the beginning, but it is. <laughs> what if I said um, I wanted it to have a magnitude of 15, but in the opposite direction? So what I mean by that is instead of going, obviously, from A to B, I would be going in that direction. Well, again, AB is 5, so we can multiply by 3, but what do you think you could do to make it go in the opposite direction? This should kind of go with what we did in the last units. Yeah, just make it negative. So if you want to go in the opposite direction, you just make your coordinates, now uh, make your components negative. So in this case, I'm going to have negative 3 times 3, negative 4, which would be negative 9, positive 12. You'd just be moving in the opposite direction. Okay. Okay. So again, these are all pretty darn easy. So what starts happening if I want a magnitude that isn't related to my movement? So I'll get a kind of a quick pick here. This is five, okay. So let's say that like, maybe I wanted the magnitude to be seven, right? That's not gonna be easy to do. If you think you have an idea, you could pause this and try it and see what the new um, vector would look like. The resultant vector that would give you a magnitude of seven. Um, if you want to pause it. If you're not and you want a little help, stay with me. Okay. So if you remember from the last unit, when we were doing parametric lines, so we were moving along a line, the first thing that we did is we scaled our vector or our movement down to one. How did we do that? Well, we divided by the magnitude of that movement. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my vector. Oops. and I'm gonna divide it by the length of the hypotenuse because I'm scaling it down to one. We also have a name for this. This is called a unit vector. Why do you think it's called a unit vector? Yeah, it's just one unit long. What's nice about scaling it down to one is you can then make it as long as you want using scalar multiplication. Okay, so let's see what this would look like. Again, AB I believe was three negative four. If I divide it by its magnitude, which was 5, then careful, don't freak out about this. This just means you have to divide each component by 5. So that would be 3 fifths, comma, negative 4 fifths. This vector, this new vector, I'm going to call it vector C. This new vector has a magnitude now of 1, which means if you want to change it to 7, all you need to do is what? Multiply by 7 which means each of these little guys is going to get multiplied by 7. So then we'd get 21 fifths, comma, negative 28 fifths for our component form of that new vector. Okay, so in general, how do we do it? Um, in general, you would take your vector and you would multiply by whatever length you want to go. So let's call that D. If D is your desired length, 
that you want to go. Then you're going to multiply, you're going to take your vector and you're going to multiply that by d, but you're going to have to divide it first by its magnitude. This will get you down to 1. This will take you as long as you want. And then all of this is what we call that scalar multiple. Because you're just multiplying. This is just a number, guys. This isn't, um, you know, it's not another vector. This is just a number out front. Okay. Okay. So we did scalar multiplication. Okay, so again, this just, ch this just uh, makes my vector longer or shorter, but doesn't change the direction. Okay. You can also think of these as your, um, these are like your directional cosines, right? For this one where it was, un was one long, you can think of this the directional cosine like we did when we did parametrics, and you can also think of that as like your directional cosine, because when it's by, when it's a length of one, that would be how much you're, moving in the x and the y direction to go 1. So it's the same directional cosines, cosines we used last time. Okay. So here's some quick examples. So if this is a vector. It's hard to see. If vector op goes from the origin out to negative 2, 5, that's a position vector because it's starting at the origin. So there we go. Always draw. What would be the endpoint of a vector that is for op? Well, first, I'd figure out what the magnitude of op is. The good news is because it comes from the origin, you know that the change in x is 2, technically negative 2, but I'm going to square it so it doesn't really matter. So let's see what we get for our magnitude. So the change in x was 2 squared plus the change in y was 5 squared, so 25 plus 4 is root 29. So there's my magnitude of this vector. Okay, so if I want to go 4 op, I'm just going to multiply my magnitude by 4. Now that, that, that'll give me my new magnitude. So my new magnitude will be 4 root 29, but it wants the actual end point. So what does that mean? Well, that means I, I need to know actually what the change in x needs to be and the change in y. Remember, we said if, if you're just going to increase your mag by a multiple of your magnitude, then you can just multiply each of the components by 4. So like I'm going to multiply the x change by 4 and the y change by 4 which would get me, which would mean I need to move negative 8, 20. Now, the cool thing is, because this is from the origin, that would be the point that you end up at. And again, if I want to go negative 1, which is basically the magnitude, the same length, so that's the same length, but in the negative direction, where would that land me? Well, again, I'm coming from the origin, and negative 1 times my coordinates would get me to 2, negative 5 or the point to negative 5. Okay. But you could start somewhere else. So let me see. Maybe I do have a blank one after this. Yeah, okay. But I could start somewhere else. So like what if I started at the point, let's see. Instead of starting at the origin, let's say that I started at like, I'm going to start at 6, negative 3. I'm going to call this C. And let's say that vector AB, which is not shown, has the components 3, negative 2. Okay? If you wanted to go negative, or let's start with an easy one, 3 of your AB from C. So I want to go 3 times the magnitude of AB, but I want it to happen from point C. You could figure out what your change in x and y would be by multiplying that by 3, because you just want to go 3 in that direction. So I would need to go 9, negative 6. This is telling me how much to change in the x and change in the y. So what's the new coordinate going to be? Like, where would that get me? Well, do it. Add 9 and take away 6. That would get me to the coordinate 15, negative 9. So if I went to 15, negative 9, that would be where I land. That would have that would be three, and it would be three times in the direction of AB. Okay. Okie doke. Um, I think I talked about this already. Yeah, I'm gonna add this part. Okay. So in this next part, we're gonna talk about well, what happens if I want to add two vectors together? Okay, and I'm gonna add it right on this page. So what if I want to add two vectors together? And you could think of this as if you were like taking a walk and the vectors represented perhaps, you know, your distance and direction that you had moved. 
So maybe I have two vectors, uh, maybe my first vector, and they don't have to start at the origin. I'm going to, because remember, you could technically make them start wherever. So I'm going to have this first one start at the origin. I'm going to call this vector A. You could think of this as, okay, vector A would be like, if this is your house here, the origin, right? Um, maybe you walked one, two, three, four, five to the east and three to the north, right? You could almost think of this as a map. Um, okay, and then maybe from there, you decided to keep walking, but you're going to change directions. And from there, you went like down six, and then you went east eight. Okay, so notice these are two vectors in component form. Change in X, change in Y, change in X, right? Okay, let's, let's, uh, what I could do is then I could graph this vector on the end of this vector because that's basically what you're doing when you're adding two vectors. So that's what I'm going to do. Let me extend my graph a little bit here. Okay, so if from here, after A, then I added to that negative 6, so I'd have to go back 6 in the X direction. Oops, I actually need some more stuff here. Okay, so I'm going to go back 6, and then up 8. So I was, I was actually headed in the wrong direction. There we go. Try that again. Okay, sorry. So I'm going to go back 6, so that would get me, here would be 5. So back 6 would get me there. And then up eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So see, there's B. There's me going five, three. And then there's me from there going negative six in the X up in the, or eight in the Y. This is called the head to tail method because you're taking, this is the head of the arrow, this is the tail of the other one, like this is the head, this is the tail. So we're saying um, you're, you're putting the head of the one and the tail of the next one together. That's, this is called the head to tail method. Okay, so where does this get us? If we had an actual, um, if we had an actual grid and we could count, what we would see is that, oh, this lands at negative one, 11. Now, let's see how that relates to the math. We'll check it out. All we need to do is total how much we went in the x direction. So our x total, we went 5 positive, but then you went back 6. You backtracked 6. So it should make sense that your resultant x direction was only a change of negative 1. You went 3 up and then another 8 up. So they worked together to give you 11. Look how we can do that. We can just literally add the x components and add the y components. So my result is here. This is your resultant vector. Now we can also do this if we technically put the two vectors at um, as position vectors. So I'm going to do two new ones. We'll do vector m is negative 3, 2, and we'll say vector n is um, 5, negative 7. Okay. We can also put them both here. I could do the head to tail method, but we're going to do it this way. So I'm going to do them both as position vectors. So negative 3, 2. So here's vector m. And then I'm going to do 5, negative 7. And there's vector n. Ooh, these ones are almost the same direction, so that's a little tricky. In fact, you know what? I'm going to make it a little nicer so that it's not, so it's a little more exaggerated. Let's do 2. Or um, let's do 3. So I'm going to go 3 and then negative 7. It'll just make it a little easier to see. Okay, so another method for doing this is something called the parallelogram method. And what I do is I draw my two position vectors. So I have the two position vectors, and they become sides in my parallelogram. So what I do is I basically draw another version of one of the sides. So like I'm going to draw this version here. And then I create this. See this parallelogram you create? So you're creating a parallelogram with the two sides. And visually, your result would be the diagonal that goes from the beginning to where these two meet. So it's your diagonal. So that's your result. Now that, that's what the resultant vector looks like. That the parallelogram. The way that we get the result is still the same. Add the x's. Oops, mine is a little off. 
can do better, I guess. My parallelogram is more like that. So my diagonal technically went from there to there. I do a better parallelogram. There we go. So my diagonal went from there to there. I can still do it algebraically by just adding. If I have a negative 3 plus a 3, I have a resultant change of 0 for x, and 2 plus negative 7 is a resultant change of negative 5. So your result gets you to the point 0, negative 5, or the vector 0, negative 5. This is called the parallelogram method because of that. So just to see, I mean, like, again, without the coordinate plane, if I just drew some vectors, like if I wanted to add these two vectors together, I'll call this C and D. Maybe I want to add these two vectors together. I'll call this um, H and K. So if I want to do the parallelogram method visually, this is roughly, here's the result. Oops, let's do that in a different color. So the result would be from the very beginning where they start to that other corner. So here, that one is C plus D. That's what you get when you add them to the orange guy. Same thing here. If I were to make that parallelogram, my result would be from here where they both start to that diagonal. So that orange, uh, the green one would be H plus K. If I wanted to do these using the head to tail method, I would have to take the first one, C, and then move, it's almost like I'm copying and pasting, D here. See this? And then your result would be the very beginning to the very end. These two vectors, this red one and that orange one, are exactly the same total change. Same thing over here. I could go H, and then I could take K and copy it right on the end of H. And my result would be the vector that goes from here to here. So this orange and that green are the, both the results. Two different ways. Parallelogram method, head to tail method. But basically, you're adding the change in x and you're adding the change in y. Okay, if for some reason you did want to subtract a vector from the other, instead of subtracting, it's easiest just to say that you're going to add a vector that goes in the opposite direction. So for example, if I wanted to take a and b, but I wanted to do a minus b, it's easiest just to think of this as vector a plus negative, the negative version of b. So if I was doing this, what I would do is do a, and then how, what, is, what would negative b look like? Remember, that would have the same length, it would just be in the opposite direction. So instead of the vector going that way, I would do head to tail with the vector going this way. And then that way I can add these two. Remember, the resultant would go from where you started to the very end. This is head to tail. So there's a minus b. Mathematically, it's super easy. Um, if vector A, you know, was 3, 4, and vector B was 7, 3, then instead of, I would just subtract them. So A minus B would be negative 4, 4 minus 3 would be 1. I mean, the math, the algebraic version is really easy. But you could also just switch this to a negative and a negative, same idea, and then add them. Okay. Okay, so in this next little part, we're going to look at if I could pick any two position vectors to add together, to move me around in, you know, like to add, to move you around to different places, um, what might be some nice vectors that we could use to get us, to move us around? So this is kind of what I mean. Like, let me draw a picture for you. If I had these two, I'm going to make these two vectors A and B again. Okay and b. So first of all, if I add these two vectors, that would get me roughly, let's see, if I copied b up here, that would get me like right there. Um, if I only, if I took a and added only half of b, then that would maybe get me here. Do you guys see that? Because I'd go a and then I'd only go half the length of b but still in that direction. And so I could get a bunch of different points. What if I wanted to get a point up here and I could add some length of a. That's what we're doing. I'm allowing you to change how long a is. Well, if you a made a twice as long, then you'd end up like here if you did 2a plus b. Or if you did 2a plus a little bit of b, you'd end up here. Is there a way to get a point that would end up here? I could add a, but with a negative b. Yeah, so I could get points over here. Could I get a point down here? You could make a negative and b really short, or even a negative and b negative and short. 
So what I'm trying to tell you is when you add these two vectors to get together and you can do various lengths of them, you can get to any point in the coordinate plane that you want. You can get to any point you want by adding various lengths of two vectors together. Okay. So again, I showed you that representation here. So if you could pick, oh, I already did that. Um, okay, so well, we can try one and then I'll do what I was gonna say. So, okay, so suppose we have um, these points, A, B, and C, they come from the origin and I wanna figure out what vectors would add up to OC. So let's, let's graph this first. So point A is out at two, negative one. So there's vector OA. Um, B is negative 5, 3. Okay. And C is 4, 7. Okay. So here's what they want you to do. They want to figure out what would P and Q have to be so that when you multiply them, you land or get vector OC. Okay, so let's think of an algebraic way to get this. I'm going to rewrite that. So I'm going to multiply OA by something. I'm going to multiply OB by something, and that's going to give me OC as a result. Well, let's fill in what we know. We know that O out to A is the vector 2, negative 1. We know that O out to B is the vector negative 5, 3. And we want that to come out to the vector that gets us to C. 4, 7. Well, let's take it one component at a time. We know that we're going to have to, whatever P is, like P could be, well, I only want to go half in this direction, you know what I mean? Or I want to go twice as long in this direction. It's only changing the magnitude. So this would be 2P for the X value. This X value would be minus 5Q. And the X's have to add up to 4. I want everybody to look at that. This is just me doing the change in x. So the change in x has to add up to 4. So see, I just took the x components. All right, what about for the y components? The y components say we have negative 1 times whatever p is, so negative p, plus 3q, and that would have to add up to the y component of 7. You've seen stuff like this before, guys. You just need to solve. This is just a system of equations. I could solve this easily by multiplying the second guy by a 2. So we end up with Q equals 18. And then once I have Q, I can use it to plug back in and get P. Oops. I could subtract 54 on both sides. So I get 47 equals, oops, negative 47 equals negative p, but p would have to be 47. So if p was 47, if you made this one increase by 47 and you made this one um, increase by 18, the result would land you here. Kind of crazy, but you could get there. So you could do, you're gonna definitely see this. So make sure you run through this a couple of times. Okay, um, in the next video, we're gonna talk about what if we picked um, a really nice version of two vectors to add together every time? So um, we'll stop here for now, take a break, and we'll come back for video two.